Hello, everybody. I'm excited to present to you today the work of my first graduate student who's now graduated and gone off to do UX research at Google, Zach. Zach is a bassist and a rock musician. So you'll see how this work is inspired by his background. So let's say Zach took me to see a metal concert. At this concert, you can see here a bunch of high identifiers with rock and hard rock music. They have all sorts of symbols and devil horns and all sorts of ways of indicating their rock fandom. They're probably also headbanging and moving their bodies with the musical beat. So let's say Zach drags me there and then we spot two people. The first person we spot looks like a typical headbanger. They have the wristbands with the spikes, the long hair, the black t-shirt, and they're bopping and, and they're headbanging to the beat. And over in the corner, there's this weird guy who's just air tapping to the beat, not moving in any other way. This individual has likely had their brains melted by attending too many entrainment workshops. So the question is, is who's the bigger rock fan? Well, with very few exceptions, most of the literature on synchrony and gestures is often devoid of social context. We often pair strangers together. People who have no shared social or musical identity. We just tell them tap or move to the music. But in this particular case, I don't think anybody would disagree with me that clearly the guy on the right is a little weird and the guy on the left is clearly a huge rock fan. They've kind of structured the whole identity around this, right? So how do we make that determination? So as a lot of social psychologists do, we're going to borrow from Gibson's affordances. Well, what's an affordance? An affordance is a possibility for action, which depends upon the experience and abilities of each individual. So let's take a young athletic person. They see this tree. This tree affords to them climbing and it affords to them exercise. If you take an older individual, this tree affords a place to rest. So these ideas are then connected to what we're going to call social affordances. So let's go back to this example and understand a social affordance, right? So let's say I am now perceiving the people around me. Well, I'm going to see Zach. He's going to be wearing black and all sorts of things and probably geared up for this concert. I'm going to see a metalhead. I'm going to see someone who can help me negotiate this event and not get lost, beaten up, or just trampled over. And he, uh, and, and further, I'm going to see these people around us as potential research subjects, because isn't that how we all see the people around us? They're just all subjects waiting to be analyzed. I'm going to see that fellow person there who's tapping as both a potential fellow synchrony researcher, or at least someone as socially awkward as me, and someone I could probably get along with. They afford camaraderie and um, someone to talk about uh, with what, what's going on around us. Zach, on the other hand, would perceive this totally differently. He would see us as poser nerds, and he would be like, oh my god, they're going to drive me crazy, and Alex is going to go off and talk to that weirdo who's tapping in the air. Instead, he's going to look for this other guy and say, that's my mosh pit buddy. That's the guy who's going to protect me when we go into the mosh pit, and he's going to have my back, and we're going to have a great time. So these social affordances lead to specific hypotheses. For example, if gestures afford musical identity, um, expertise of the gesture and the perceiver will matter and they're going to affect the perception of the target's musical identity so if you yourself are a hard rock uh, enthusiast you are going to perceive the movements of the individuals differently than someone who does not have that expertise so musical identity is a concept often wrapped up with the idea of social identity. Social identity is a way of indicating to others your group membership. People can express and reinforce these through discussion of musical preferences and wearing symbols. But we don't want that in this study. We want to go purely based on the gestures. So in the stimulus we create, it's going to be devoid of this kind of information. So what we're going to look to see is if gestures afford musical identity, performing an identity relevant gesture in other words, something like headbanging, should be perceived as higher in the target's musical identity. So if you're headbanging, you should be someone who likes hard rock and metal. This also could relate to synchrony research. And in previous work, we've shown, for example, that the degree to which you yourself move in synchrony with the music, regardless of what your partner does, helps you form bonding relationships and positive feelings towards that other individual. And it turns out that when people synchronize together, when two people are doing something, others perceive the group as being more together. People think that they like each other more and they're more efficacious as a group, especially for things that related to social action.
So the hypothesis here is that the more synchronous the gesture with the music, the stronger the affordance of the musical identity. So there are three studies. I cannot take you through all the details. The first one is basically just to figure out which gestures are the best, examine the reliability, and it doesn't have music. The second study also doesn't have any music. It's purely based on the gesture. And the question is that the identity of the perceiver and the target matter. In other words, is there an actual social affordance happening here? Or is it really just based on what the target is doing? It has nothing to do with the perceiver. And finally, does the synchronousness of the gesture afford musical identity? In other words, does it act as another cue to help someone determine someone's hard rock identity? So the main question will be, do synchronous musical gestures afford hard rock identity? Well, first, we're going to measure the perceiver's hard rock identity, the person viewing the videos. Second, we're gonna look at the gesture's hard rock identity, and we're gonna have two extremes here, someone who's a rock musician and someone who's a classical musician who doesn't know anything about rock music. And then we're going to have the hard rock relevance of the gesture they're performing. I'll show you those in a second. And whether the gesture is performed synchronously to music or not. So, so these videos were created through motion capture figures, and they were wearing body suits during the recordings. Both of these videos are of the expert, Zach. And here you're going to see an identity relevant gesture, head banging. You can see He's moving in a particular way. It's measured at, I think, 60 hertz. And then you can see him doing what uh, we call twisting, which could be done at any kind of musical concert. I preferred the name Dad Dance, but I lost on that one. Right? Looks like a Dad Dance. I don't think it's twisting. But anyway, so in this particular case, we see these two types of gestures. These are the ones that won out from other gestures that we had looked at and tested. Now we're going to use key uh, social measures that were previously developed and we just adapted. We tested their reliability. And basically we're asking, to what extent is your hard rock fandom central to the following? And those uh, usually revolve around reputation, building relationships with others, and signaling to others your group member. And that had high reliability. And for the two gestures, the selected gestures that we have, it's the same, but it's asking about the person in the video. So they answered this question every time they watched the video about that person's reputation, their feeling with others, and do they signal to other group members. So it's a two by two within design, no music in the first study, and a two by two by two design in the uh, third study where it was done synchronously or asynchronously. So for example, Zach, the expert rocker, is going to headbang synchronously to the music, or he's going to headbang asynchronously to the music, which would be 15% faster or 15% slower, counterbalanced across the various repeated trials of each of these videos. And then my other grad student, who knows nothing about headbanging and nothing about rock music, was taught to headbang, which is was extremely funny to watch her learn. And then she also did the twisting. And we actually did not have her watch Zach perform them. We instructed her on how to do them so she wasn't mirroring him too much. That's going to be interacted with the perceiver's hard rock identity. And each study was well powered to detect small effects in a fully within subject uh, uh, experimental design. Now, um, the summary comes down, let's just go quickly through the main effects. There was a clear effect of gesture relevance. In other words, head banging clearly affords rock fandom. It's much stronger than the twist. Synchrony also affords higher rank rock fandom, though there's some interactions there we'll all come back to. And the, the, the clearest effect in the study was that the higher your own uh, the higher the perceiver's rock identity, the more they perceived the movements of the other person as a rock musician. And that also had various interactions to deal with. Now, the expertise was a little bit more complicated. There was a main effect, but there's also a bunch of interactions which we need to unpack. I'm going to have to go through this quickly, and I'm cutting a lot of results out just to get to the main point. First, and most importantly, in just viewing the gestures, you can clearly see the hard rock identity effect. Low identifiers are less likely to perceive them as hard rock, and that's uh, high identifiers do. And there's an interaction for expert performers. So the experts, uh, when you're a high identifier, perceiving an expert, it doesn't matter which gesture they're moving, they just perceive them as an expert. But when they perceive, when novices perceive, they're actually looking at Zach and saying, well, when he's headbanging, he clearly looks like a rocker. When he's not headbanging uh, and he's just twisting, 
he doesn't really look like a rocker. Whereas for the novice performer, we see a much more balanced than just a main effect kind of effect. No interaction there. So for experts, low identifiers use relevance to determine hard rock identity, where high identifiers really do not. It seems like they're just relying on expertise or something else. Now, in study three, when the music is introduced, what we see is that the interaction was not where it was expected. We expected it to be more relevant for experts, but that's not what happened. It actually became more relevant for novices. So high identifiers actually look at the novice and distinguish. When the novice, who's probably not moving exactly right, but when they're moving in synchrony, they get a little bonus. When they're moving out of sync, they get a little bit of a tractor. Traditional social theory would have said that people who identify as experts would be more critical of other people who are claiming to be part of their in-group. That's not at all what this shows. We'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. Basically, sync matters when you're a novice, um, but it seems to be driven by these high identifiers. So they're perceiving these outsiders differently. But uh, positively, as you can see, the means are almost identical between the two. And finally, sync only seems to matter when you're not doing the right thing. So in other words, if you're moving irrelevantly, that's when sync matters. But as I showed you earlier, there's that kind of complex three-way interaction to deal with. So it's a little hard to unpack. So in summary, as we start to think through building larger theories of synchrony, especially with the interest growing in social mechanisms, we need to think carefully about the social context in which we do these studies. We need to think about the social and musical identities of those individuals that are involved. Bringing random strangers may not always be a good idea, or we should at least try to connect the random strangers through some shared identity when we have them do these tasks and that the gesture that they do matters. We should stop relying on just finger tapping and rocking chairs and circle drawing and actually move into gestures that make sense uh, given the musical context which we're putting people in. So we wanna think through these issues as we build a larger theory, but there's some really interesting things that distinguish us from social theories. And there was this curious finding that social identity theory really has a clear prediction about what should have happened in terms of experts rejecting posers. And that's not what happened. Posers were not rejected. In fact, what came across was that these people that identified as, as um, high in hard rock identity were more open and accepting of, of even the novice when they were performing weird gestures. They didn't seem to reject them and, and, and write negative things in the, in the qualitative portion. So it may be that musical identities are themselves more open and inviting to other than other social identities. But the question is, is this only true for rock music? And is that because rock music's older and necessarily not as uh, um, hip as some of the other music that's pushing more uh, counterculture themes as it once did in the 90s? So, so I wanna thank everybody for listening and I'm excited to take your questions. And it may be that Metallica was right in the 90s that posers can't headbang, but it seems like in 2023, hose, posers can headbang and Rock musicians seem okay with them. Uh, so thanks, everybody. I'm here. Yay, amazing. Oh, my goodness, that was so wonderful. Thank you for making the last uh, talk of the day a comedic one. And I'm sure that Zach would be super proud of you despite your, you know, poser self status. Um, yeah. I will just, I wanted to start us off because um, I, just in order to understand the results a bit better, do you happen to have the videos of your other student who was actually headbanging? Um, and twisting, because I think that that could help us I mean, visualize what this poser really looked like and understand maybe why the rock musicians, or I don't know, just get a better perspective. If that's possible, if yeah. you to share your screen, let me make sure that's okay. Here. I will do that. I should have them here. Let me just, I can play the music. I was worried about playing the music because of copyright strikes from Oh, all right, yeah. here we go. But we can cut it out if it, if they flag the video. We can uh, probably cut it out um, to next week when we post it. Okay. Or you can not share your sound as the other option. Um, I can mute the sound. Amazing, thank so you. So here, oh, uh, here's the expert syncing to music. So this is Zach, and he's pretty in time with the music. And one of the things you'll notice is what one of the things we noticed is that he really does look like a rocker. Um, and watching when the other students started doing it, uh, it took a while to get her to do it correctly. She's a little fast here from the same beat, but she doesn't look like a rocker. Hmm. Um, 
In fact, it was really interesting is that um, um, when we first, you know, proposed this idea, this is what'd be happening. People said, no, they can't determine it, but there's actually a lot of Gibsonian research that says people determine from light point light diagrams, the differences between groups pretty readily, especially if you're an expert. And when we watched more and more videos of the two of them doing it, it was pretty clear that the effect was there. Hmm. But did, did you ask the participants like what they thought of those people too, or like their, how well they were like performing the headbanging gesture? Yes, so there was a questionnaire at the, well, there was an open-ended questionnaire as to try to get at what the aspect of the gestures and cues they were using to make their determination. And there's a kind of qualitative analysis at the end. In general, they were not very well descriptive. And I think that's the trouble with sometimes unpacking affordances is what is it the aspect of, and you kind of have to isolate it piece by piece to determine it. But there is something in the specific way there's that gesture there about the way they're moving specifically the whole body, which seems to indicate that part. But again, it's hard to unpack. Hmm. Super interesting. Um, this actually, it kind of reminded me of um, a study that Persephone Tsunaki presented at one point where um, people were like in training or tapping with people and then it, the, they were actually tapping with a computer and then the computer was doing weird things and the people were like she interviewed them afterwards to ask what their experience they were like saying things like oh like yeah even though it wasn't uh, synchronized like I still thought they could have been a good person just because they struggle with it doesn't really you know maybe they you know had an issue or something and I like yeah. like uh, yeah just the way like the arm was shaped in that video made me think like maybe that could also be a thing, like you can appreciate that's a person trying to get grooved to the music, yeah. but uh, I don't yes. know, that's my take. Are there any other questions here? Sorry. Thank you. Um, I was waiting for you to say that uh, synchrony didn't matter and I feel so justified. I mean, it, it's good that it matters to the novice, but it doesn't matter for the expert. And I think that's consistent with the environments in which this kind of behavior is performed. Because if you go to concerts, you see people fall out of sync all the time. And it's also an acoustic environment where people um, are very distant from each other if you have a festival crowd. And so you can't judge people based off of the synchrony of your hearing of their motion. You know, that comparison just doesn't work. So there's just all kinds of physical and, and contextual reasons for the synchrony to be way less important than the quality of the movement. Um, but when we take synchrony out, how do we encode the quality of their movements otherwise? And that's, <laughs> yeah, that's the question from the Gibsonians. They spent a lot of energy trying to get at, for example, how you determine expertise, for example, the ability to detect someone um, who's muggable and who's not muggable. And it has to do with the sound of the footsteps, the speed of the walk. And there's a lot of information encoded in just the sounds of the way people were moving. Here in the motion, again, it's one of these very difficult ineffable qualities. It's just, you see it and you know it. And it happens in movies all the time. When you, old Star Trek, when they're picking up rocks to throw at the alien, you know it's a rock that weighs one pound. You can see that all of the body movement picking up that rock doesn't match. So the question is, where does that expertise come and evolve from? And it's gotta be through the training and through being around others who do it. But in terms of the synchrony, you're, you're right. We didn't think it would be a strong effect. We did think, however, um, it would, so the results came out backwards for the experts. They were expected as they gained expertise, they would be more judgmental of Zach and say he's not a real expert and, and there would be more distinction. And that's not what they showed. And we thought there the separation would occur and no, not there either. So it seems like your point that they're actually wealthy, welcoming people into their fold is much more likely. I think that's also tying it back to like the genre, sociocultural context of like how precise those things are. Maybe a beat bin study might go along well with this. Um, yeah. Are there any uh, further questions? Amazing. We are actually at the end. We're a little over time. So next up, we have some finger food downstairs. We wish we could share it with you, Alexander. But uh, next time, you'll have to come over and hang out with us at Ritmo. So thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Have a good Thanks. rest of your day.